Part five of the Diary of a Superfluous Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Geeson. The Diary of a Superfluous Man by Ivan Turgenev. Translated by Constance Garnet. Part five. March the twenty ninth. A slight frost. Yesterday it was thawing. Yesterday I had not the strength to go on with my diary. Like Poprishchin, I lay for the most part on my bed and talked to Terentyevna. What a woman! Sixty years ago she lost her first betrothed from the plague. She has outlived all her children. She is inexcusably old, drinks tea to her heart's desire, is well-fed and warmly clothed. And what do you suppose she was talking to me about all day yesterday? I had sent another utterly destitute old woman the collar of an old livery, half moth-eaten, to put on her vest. She wears strips over the chest by way of vest. And why wasn't it given to her? But I'm your nurse, I should think. Oh, oh, my good sir, it's too bad of you, after I've looked after you as I have. And so on. The merciless old woman utterly wore me out with her reproaches. But to get back to my story... And so I suffered like a dog whose hind quarters have been run over by a wheel. It was only then, only after my banishment from the Ozhogin's house, that I fully realized how much happiness a man can extract from the contemplation of his own unhappiness. Oh, men! Pitiful race, indeed! But away with philosophical reflections! I spent my days in complete solitude, and could only by the most roundabout and even humiliating methods find out what was passing in the Ozhogin's household, and what the prince was doing. My man had made friends with the cousin of the latter's coachman's wife. This acquaintance afforded me some slight relief, and my man soon guessed, from my hints and little presents, what he was to talk about to his master when he pulled his boots off every evening. Sometimes I chanced to meet some one of the Ozhogin's family, Bismyonkov or the prince in the street. To the prince and to Bismyonkov I bowed, but I did not enter into conversation with them. Lisa I only saw three times, once with her mamma in a fashionable shop, once in an open carriage with her father and mother and the prince, and once in church. Of course I was not impudent enough to approach her, and only watched her from a distance. In the shop she was very much preoccupied, but cheerful. She was ordering something for herself and busily matching ribbons. Her mother was gazing at her with her hands folded on her lap and her nose in the air, smiling, with that foolish and devoted smile which is only permissible in adoring mothers. In the carriage with the prince, Lisa was... I shall never forget that meeting. The old people were sitting in the back seats of the carriage, the prince and Lisa in the front. She was paler than usual. On her cheek two patches of pink could just be seen. She was half facing the prince leaning on her straight right arm, in the left hand she was holding a sunshade, with her little head drooping languidly, she was looking straight into his face with her expressive eyes. At that instant she surrendered herself utterly to him, entrusted herself to him forever. I had not time to get a good look at his face. The carriage galloped by too quickly. But I fancy that he too was deeply touched. The third time I saw her in church. Not more than ten days had passed since the day when I met her in the carriage with the prince. Not more than three weeks since the day of my duel. 
The business upon which the prince had come to O was by now completed, but he still kept putting off his departure. At Petersburg he was reported to be ill. In the town it was expected every day that he would make a proposal in form to Kirilla Matveitch. I was myself only awaiting this final blow to go away for ever. The town of O had grown hateful to me. I could not stay indoors and wandered from morning to night about the suburbs. One grey, gloomy day, as I was coming back from a walk, which had been cut short by the rain, I went into a church. The evening service had only just begun. There were very few people. I looked round me, and suddenly, near a window, caught sight of a familiar profile. For the first instant I did not recognize it. That pale face, that spiritless glance, those sunken cheeks. Could it be the same Lisa I had seen a fortnight before? Wrapped in a cloak without a hat on, with the cold light from the broad white window falling on her from one side, she was gazing fixedly at the holy image, and seemed striving to pray striving to awake from a sort of listless stupor. A red-cheeked, fat little page with yellow trimmings on his chest was standing behind her, and, with his hands clasped behind his back, stared in sleepy bewilderment at his mistress. I trembled all over, and was about to go up to her, but stopped short. I felt choked by a torturing presentiment. Till the very end of the evening service, Lisa did not stir. All the people went out. A beadle began sweeping out the church, but still she did not move from her place. The page went up to her, said something to her, touched her dress. She looked round, passed her hand over her face, and went away. I followed her home at a little distance, and then returned to my lodging. "'She is lost!' I cried when I had got into my room. "'As a man, I don't know to this day what my sensations were at that moment. "'I flung myself, I remember, with clasped hands on the sofa "'and fixed my eyes on the floor. "'But I don't know. In the midst of my woe, I was, as it were, pleased at something.' I would not admit this for anything in the world if I were not writing only for myself. I had been tormented, certainly, by terrible, harassing suspicions, and who knows I should perhaps have been greatly disconcerted if they had not been fulfilled. Such is the heart of man, some middle-aged Russian teacher would exclaim at this point in an expressive voice while he raises a fat forefinger adorned with a cornelian ring. But what have we to do with the opinion of a Russian teacher with an expressive voice and a cornelian on his finger? Be that as it may, my presentiment turned out to be well founded. Suddenly the news was all over the town that the prince had gone away, presumably in consequence of a summons from Petersburg that he had gone away without making any proposal to Kirilla Matveitch or his wife, and that Lisa would have to deplore his treachery till the end of her days. The prince's departure was utterly unexpected, for only the evening before his coachman, so my man assured me, had not the slightest suspicion of his master's intentions. This piece of news threw me into a perfect fever. I at once dressed, and was on the point of hastening to the Ozhogins, but on thinking the matter over I considered it more seemly to wait till the next day. I lost nothing, however, by remaining at home. The same evening there came to see me in all haste a certain Pan Dopipopulo, a wandering Greek stranded by some chance in the town of O, a scandal-monger of the first magnitude who had been more indignant with me than any one for my duel with the prince. He did not even give my man time to announce him. He fairly burst into my room, warmly pressed my hand, begged my pardon a thousand times, 
called me a paragon of magnanimity and courage, painted the prince in the darkest colours, censured the old Ozhogins, who in his opinion had been punished as they deserved, made a slighting reference to Lisa in passing, and hurried off again, kissing me on my shoulder. Among other things I learned from him that the prince, en vrai grand seigneur, on the eve of his departure, in response to a delicate hint from Kirilla Matveitch, had answered coldly that he had no intention of deceiving anyone, and no idea of marrying, had risen, made his bow, and that was all. Next day I set off to the Ozhogins. The short-sighted footman leapt up from his bench on my appearance, with the rapidity of lightning. I bade him announce me. The footman hurried away and returned at once. "'Walk in,' he said. "'You are begged to go in.' I went into Kirilla Matveitch's study. "'The rest tomorrow.' March the 30th. Frost. And so I went into Kirilla Matveitch's study. I would pay anyone handsomely who could show me now my own face at the moment when that highly respected official, hurriedly flinging together his dressing gown, approached me with outstretched arms. I must have been a perfect picture of modest triumph indulgent sympathy, and boundless magnanimity. I felt myself something in the style of Scipio Africanus. Ozhogin was visibly confused and cast down. He avoided my eyes and kept fidgeting about. I noticed, too, that he spoke unnaturally loudly, and in general expressed himself very vaguely. Vaguely, but with warmth, he begged my forgiveness, vaguely alluded to their departed guest, added a few vague generalities about deception and the instability of earthly blessings, and suddenly feeling the tears in his eyes, hastened to take a pinch of snuff, probably in order to deceive me as to the cause of his tearfulness. He used the Russian green snuff, and it's well known that that article forces even old men to shed tears that make the human eye look dull and senseless for several minutes. I behaved, of course, very cautiously with the old man, inquired after the health of his wife and daughter, and at once artfully turned the conversation on to the interesting subject of the rotation of crops. I was dressed as usual, but the feeling of gentle propriety and soft indulgence which filled me gave me a fresh and festive sensation, as though I had on a white waistcoat and a white cravat. One thing agitated me, the thought of seeing Lisa. Ozhogin at last proposed of his own accord to take me up to his wife. The kind-hearted but foolish woman was at first terribly embarrassed on seeing me, but her brain was not capable of retaining the same impression for long, and so she was soon at her ease. At last I saw Lisa. She came into the room. I had expected to find in her a shamed and penitent sinner, and had assumed beforehand the most affectionate and reassuring expression of face. Why lie about it? I really loved her, and was thirsting for the happiness of forgiving her, of holding out a hand to her. But to my unutterable astonishment, in response to my significant bow, she laughed coldly, observed carelessly, Oh, is that you? and at once turned away from me. It is true that her laugh struck me as forced and in any case did not accord well with her terribly thin face. But all the same I had not expected such a reception. I looked at her with amazement. What a change had taken place in her! Between the child she had been and the woman before me there was nothing in common. She had, as it were, grown up, straightened out. 
all the features of her face, especially her lips, seemed defined. Her gaze had grown deeper, harder and gloomier. I stayed on at the Ozhogins till dinner time. She got up, went out of the room, and came back again, answered questions with composure, and designedly took no notice of me. She wanted, I saw, to make me feel that I was not worth her anger. Though I had been within an ace of killing her lover, I lost patience at last. A malicious allusion broke from my lips. She started, glanced swiftly at me, got up, and going to the window, pronounced in rather a shaky voice, "'You can say anything you like.' "'But let me tell you that I love that man, and always shall love him, "'and do not consider that he has done me any injury. "'Quite the contrary.' "'Her voice broke. She stopped, tried to control herself, but could not, "'burst into tears and went out of the room. "'The old people were much upset. "'I pressed the hands of both, sighed turned my eyes heavenward and withdrew i am too weak i have too little time left i am not capable of describing in the same detail the new range of torturing reflections firm resolutions and all the other fruits of what is called inward conflict that arose within me after the renewal of my acquaintance with the ozhogins I did not doubt that Liza still loved, and would long love, the prince. But as one reconciled to the inevitable, and anxious myself to conciliate, I did not even dream of her love. I desired only her affection. I desired to gain her confidence, her respect, which, we are assured by persons of experience, forms the surest basis for happiness in marriage. Unluckily, I lost sight of one rather important circumstance, which was that Lisa had hated me ever since the day of the duel. I found this out too late. I began, as before, to be a frequent visitor at the house of the Ozhogins. Kirilla Matveitch received me with more effusiveness and affability than he had ever done. I have even ground for believing that he would at that time have cheerfully given me his daughter, though I was certainly not a match to be coveted. Public opinion was very severe upon him and Lisa, while on the other hand it extolled me to the skies. Lisa's attitude to me was unchanged. She was for the most part silent, obeyed when they begged her to eat showed no outward signs of sorrow, but for all that was wasting away like a candle. I must do Kirilla Matveitch the justice to say that he spared her in every way. Old Madame Ozhogin only ruffled up her feathers like a hen as she looked at her poor nestling. There was only one person Lisa did not shun, though she did not talk much even to him, and that was Bismyonkov. The old people were rather short, not to say rude, in their behaviour to him. They could not forgive him for having been second in the duel. But he went on going to see them, as though he did not notice their unamiability. With me he was very chilly, and, strange to say, I felt, as it were, afraid of him. This state of things went on for a fortnight. At last, after a sleepless night, I resolved to have it out with Lisa to open my heart to her, to tell her that in spite of the past, in spite of all possible gossip and scandal, I should consider myself only too happy if she would give me her hand and restore me her confidence. I really did seriously imagine that I was showing what they call in the school reading books an unparalleled example of magnanimity, and that from sheer amazement alone she would consent. In any case, I resolved to have an explanation, and to escape at last from suspense. Behind the Ozhogins' house was a rather large garden, which ended in a little grove of lime-trees, neglected and overgrown. 
In the middle of this thicket stood an old summer-house in the Chinese style. A wooden paling separated the garden from a blind alley. Lisa would sometimes walk for hours together alone in this garden. Kirilla Matveitch was aware of this and forbade her being disturbed or followed. Let her grief wear itself out, he said. When she could not be found indoors, they only had to ring a bell on the steps at dinner-time, and she made her appearance at once, with the same stubborn silence on her lips and in her eyes, and some little leaf crushed up in her hand. So, noticing one day that she was not in the house, I made a show of going away, took leave of Kirilla Matveitch, put on my hat and went out from the hall into the courtyard, and from the courtyard into the street, but promptly darted in at the gate again with extraordinary rapidity, and hurried past the kitchen into the garden. Luckily no one noticed me. Without losing time in deliberation, I went with rapid steps into the grove. In a little path before me was standing Lisa. My heart beat violently. I stood still, drew a deep sigh, and was just on the point of going up to her, when suddenly she lifted her hand without turning round, and began listening. From behind the trees, in the direction of the blind alley, came a distinct sound of two knocks, as though someone were tapping at the paling. Lisa clapped her hands together. There was heard the faint creak of the gate, and out of the thicket stepped Bismyonkov. I hastily hid behind a tree. Lisa turned towards him without speaking. Without speaking, he drew her arm in his, and the two walked slowly along the path together. I looked after them in amazement. They stopped, looked round, disappeared behind the bushes, reappeared again, and finally went into the summer-house. This summer-house was a diminutive round edifice with a door and one little window. In the middle stood an old one-legged table, overgrown with fine green moss. Two discoloured deal benches stood along the sides, some distance from the damp and darkened walls. Here, on exceptionally hot days in bygone times, perhaps once a year or so, they had drunk tea. The door did not quite shut. The window-frame had long ago come out of the window, and hung disconsolately, only attached at one corner, like a bird's broken wing. I stole up to the summer-house, and peeped cautiously through the chink in the window. Lisa was sitting on one of the benches, with her head drooping. Her right hand lay on her knees. The left, Bismyonkov, was holding in both his hands. He was looking sympathetically at her. "'How do you feel today?' he asked her in a low voice. "'Just the same,' she answered. "'Not better, not worse.' "'The emptiness, the fearful emptiness,' she added, raising her eyes dejectedly. Bismyonkov made her no answer. "'What do you think?' she went on. "'Will he write to me once more?' "'I don't think so.' Elizaveta Kirillovna. She was silent. And after all, why should he write? He told me everything in his first letter. I could not be his wife. But I have been happy. Not for long. I, I have been happy. Bismyonkov looked down. Ah, oh, she went on quickly. If you knew how I loathe that Chulka Turin. I always fancy I see on that man's hands his blood. I shuddered behind my chink. Though indeed, she added dreamily, who knows, perhaps, if it had not been for that duel. Oh, when I saw him wounded, I felt at once that I was altogether his. Chulkaturin loves you, observed Bismyonkov. What is that to me? I don't want anyone's love. She stopped and added slowly, "'Except yours. "'Yes, my friend, your love is necessary to me. "'Except for you I should be lost. "'You have helped me to bear terrible moments.' 
she broke off. Bismyonkov began with fatherly tenderness stroking her hand. There's no help for it. What is one to do? What is one to do, Lizaveta Kirillovna? he repeated several times. And now, indeed, she went on in a lifeless voice, I should die, I think, if it were not for you. It's you alone that keep me up. Besides, you remind me of him. You knew all about it, you see. Do you remember how fine he was that day? But forgive me, it must be hard for you. Go on, go on, nonsense, bless you, Bismyonkov interrupted her. She pressed his hand. You are very good, Bismyonkov, she went on. You are as good as an angel. What can I do? I feel I shall love him to the grave. I have forgiven him. I am grateful to him. God give him happiness. May God give him a wife after his own heart. And her eyes filled with tears. If only he does not forget me. If only he will sometimes think of his Lisa. Let us go, she added after a brief silence. Bismyonkov raised her hand to his lips. I know, she began again hotly, everyone is blaming me now. Everyone is throwing stones at me. Let them. I wouldn't anyway change my misery for their happiness. No. No. He did not love me for long, but he loved me. He never deceived me. He never told me I should be his wife. I never dreamed of it myself. It was only poor papa hoped for it. And even now I'm not altogether unhappy. The memory remains to me. And however fearful the results. Oh, I'm stifling here. It was here I saw him the last time. Let's go into the air. They got up. I had only just time to skip on one side and hide behind a thick lime tree. They came out of the summer house, and as far as I could judge by the sound of their steps, went away into the thicket. I don't know how long I went on standing there, without stirring from my place, plunged in a sort of senseless amazement, when suddenly I heard steps again. I started and peeped cautiously out from my hiding place. Bismyonkov and Lisa were coming back along the same path. Both were greatly agitated, especially Bismyonkov. I fancied he was crying. Lisa stopped, looked at him, and distinctly uttered the following words. I do consent, Bismyonkov. I would never have agreed if you were only trying to save me, to rescue me from a terrible position. But you love me. You know everything, and you love me. I shall never find a trustier, truer friend. I will be your wife. Bismyonkov kissed her hand. She smiled at him mournfully and moved away towards the house. Bismyonkov rushed into the thicket, and I went my way. Seeing that Bismyonkov had apparently said to Lisa precisely what I had intended to say to her, and she had given him precisely the reply I was longing to hear from her, there was no need for me to trouble myself further. Within a fortnight she was married to him. The older Joggins were thankful to get any husband for her. Now, tell me, am I not a superfluous man? Didn't I play throughout the whole story the part of a superfluous person? The prince's part, of that it's needless to speak. Bismyonkov's part, too, is comprehensible. But I, with what object was I mixed up in it? A senseless fifth wheel to the cart. Ah, oh, it's bitter, bitter for me. But there, as the barge haulers say, one more pull and one more yet. One day more and one more yet. And there will be no more bitter nor sweet for me. March the 31st 
I'm in a bad way. I'm writing these lines in bed. Since yesterday evening there has been a sudden change in the weather. Today is hot. Almost a summer day. Everything is thawing, breaking up, flowing away. The air is full of the smell of the opened earth. A strong, heavy, stifling smell. Steam is rising on all sides. The sun seems beating, seems smiting everything to pieces. I am very ill. I feel that I am breaking up. I meant to write my diary, and instead of that, what have I done? I have related one incident of my life. I gossiped on. Slumbering reminiscences were awakened and drew me away. I have written without haste, in detail, as though I had years before me. And here, now, there's no time to go on. Death! Death is coming. I can hear the menacing crescendo. The time has come. The time is come. And indeed, what does it matter? Isn't it all the same, whatever I write? In sight of death, the last earthly cares vanish. I feel I have grown calm. I'm becoming simpler, clearer. Too late, I've gained sense. It's a strange thing. I have grown calm. Certainly, and at the same time, I'm full of dread. Yes, I'm full of dread. Half hanging over the silent, yawning abyss, I shudder, turn away, with greedy intentness, gaze at everything about me. Every object is doubly precious to me. I cannot gaze enough at my poor, cheerless room, saying farewell to each spot on my walls. Take your fill for the last time, my eyes. Life is retreating. Slowly and smoothly she is flying away from me, as the shore flies from the eyes of the one at sea. The old yellow face of my nurse, tied up in a dark kerchief, the hissing samovar on the table, the pot of geranium in the window, and you, my poor dog, Tresor, the pen I write these lines with, my own hand, I see you now, here you are, here. Is it possible? Can it be, today? I shall never see you again. It's hard for a live creature to part with life. Why do you fawn on me, poor dog? Why do you come putting your forepaws on the bed, with your stump of a tail wagging so violently, and your kind, mournful eyes fixed on me all the while? Are you sorry for me, or do you feel already that your master will soon be gone? Oh, if only I could keep my thoughts, too, resting on all the objects in my room. I know these reminiscences are dismal and of no importance, but I have no other. The emptiness, the fearful emptiness, as Lisa said. Oh, my God! My God! Here I am dying. A heart capable of loving and ready to love will soon cease to beat. And can it it will be still forever without having once known happiness, without having once expanded under the sweet burden of bliss. Alas, it's impossible, impossible, I know. If only now, at least, before death. For death, after all, is a sacred thing. It, after all, it elevates any being. If any kind, sad, friendly voice would sing over me a farewell song of my own sorrow. I could perhaps be resigned to it. But to die stupidly, stupidly. I believe I'm beginning to rave. 
farewell, life, farewell, my garden, and you, my lime-trees. When the summer comes, do not forget to be clothed with flowers from head to foot, and may it be sweet for people to lie in your fragrant shade, on the fresh grass, among the whispering chatter of your leaves, lightly stirred by the wind. Farewell, farewell. Farewell everything, and forever. Farewell, Lisa. I wrote those two words and almost laughed aloud. This exclamation strikes me as taken out of a book. It's as though I were writing a sentimental novel and ending up a despairing letter. Tomorrow is the first of April. Can I be going to die tomorrow? That would really be too unseemly. It's just right for me, though. How the doctor did chatter today. April the 1st. It is over. Life is over. I shall certainly die today. It's hot outside, almost suffocating. Or is it that my lungs are already refusing to breathe? My little comedy is played out. The curtain is falling. Sinking into nothing... I cease to be superfluous. Oh, how brilliant that sun is! Those mighty beams breathe of eternity. Farewell, Terentyevna. This morning, as she sat at the window, she was crying, perhaps over me, and perhaps because she too will soon have to die. I have made her promise not to kill Tresor. It's hard for me to write. I will put down the pen. It's high time. Death is already approaching with ever-increasing rumble, like a carriage at night over the pavement. It is here. It is flitting about me, like the light breath which made the prophet's hair stand up on end. I am dying. Live, you who are living, and about the grave may youthful life rejoice, and nature, heedless, glow with eternal beauty. Note by the editor. Under this last line was a head in profile, with a big streak of hair and moustaches, with eyes en face, and eyelashes like rays, and under the head someone had written the following words. This manuscript was read, and the contents of it not approved, by Peter Zudotyeshin. My... My, my, my dear sir, Peter Zudotyeshin, dear sir. But as the handwriting of these lines was not in the least like the handwriting in which the other part of the manuscript was written, the editor considers that he is justified in concluding that the above lines were added subsequently by another person, especially since it has come to his, the editor's knowledge that Mr. Chulkaturin actually did die on the night between the 1st and 2nd of April, in the year 18, at his native place, Sheep's Springs. End of Part 5 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey End of the Diary of a Superfluous Man By Ivan Turgenev Translated by Constance Garnett